I do not want to take away from the quality of Oppenheimer. It is a very important film in the modern landscape and challenging in the best ways and some of the worst ones. So since you're here, give this video a like and let's dive in. It's 181 minutes, mostly dialogue driven and features cutting and jumping back and forth between multiple time periods in history. It's also a thematic heavyweight, not a pleasant, happy experience. The subject matter is actually quite sober. It will leave an impression on you and have you musing on it for hours or even days afterwards. In fact, I think there will be even more to pick up on from later viewings and repeated viewings of this movie. But before I can talk about what's mesmerizing about it, I need to address my glaring nitpicks and issues. I love the movie, and it may seem like I'm focusing more on the bad than good this time, but just stay with me until the end, I promise. And you know what? Subscribe while you're at it if you haven't already. I have not read the American Prometheus book which inspires this, but before this film was announced, despite recognizing the name, I wasn't overly familiar with the long history of J. Robert Oppenheimer and all the details. From my understanding, Christopher Nolan has gone to great lengths to be as accurate as possible to what's in the book, Oppenheimer's documented life, and the science tied up in it all. I won't be factoring that into my experience as I'll let the history buffs break that down. But if you are curious on what I have to say on other matters, make sure you ring that bell to be notified of any time I upload a new video. First off, another Christopher Nolan movie, another set of audio issues. You know me, you know all of my subtitles, as I feel they enhance my experience and help me pick up on details easy to miss on viewings without them. And like many Nolan films before it, Oppenheimer desperately needs them available. It could be the IMAX theater mixing I was in, but I'm tired of blaming the theater since this one was actually a great theater when it's constantly an issue with his movies. Tenet, Dunkirk, The Dark Knight Rises, even Inception, and more I've had issues with or know folks that have. Much of the dialogue in this film was lost on me at times. I just couldn't understand it or hear it due to loud music and mumbling from the actors. I know Nolan believes in the intelligence of the audience, but this hurts accessibility. And as far as I know, I'm not hard of hearing. It's a huge problem with Nolan movies, one that I wish he really would address with the criticism because something needs to change. But I'm thankful for Matt Damon's line delivery because I understood everything he said. Issues like this do affect my enjoyment. Luckily, the movie does a solid job providing visual context clues or multiple additional conversations to help you catch up if you miss something. But again, hopefully no one addresses this going forward. I'm kind of tired of talking about it when I'm talking about how great his movies are. I've got to mention this. And I want to be very careful with this next complaint because this is technically two complaints in one. The movie is not only very long, but incredibly complex. Nolan loves his multiple timeline jumping and it returns here. For the most part, it largely works. Occasionally, it took me a second to figure out where we were in space and time and years, and dialogue is key to understanding that. But, well, when it's hard to hear, it can be hard to follow, especially at the pace it keeps for so long. It is a well-paced three hours considering, but it's constantly jumping back and forth, and when it really crescendos, it leans on how well you've understood the timelines and all. It rewards paying attention, which I love, but I will admit at times, it can be a struggle to keep up with the genius on display in Christopher Nolan. Kind of ironic, given the subject matter. But that brings me to part two of the length and complexity. It feels like two movies edited into one. The film crescendos into this giant, jaw-dropping moment to the Trinity test, and then the bomb drops in real life, and it feels like it could have ended any given moment. And it just keeps going, and going for like 30 more minutes, and that 30 minutes feels like it dovetailed into a whole other story that was wrapped up a little bit quickly, but could have been a whole other movie. It really felt like a separate story by that point that was looking for a solid place to end. I kept thinking that it was going to cut to black and it didn't. When it ends though, oh boy, hold on to your butts. So I do think a two-parter could have worked here with one film set around his early life and the bomb and one, one set around the fallout and the H-bomb work and hearings later on, but that was Nolan's vision. So I'm left with this. A lot of this film could have been cut, especially the long prologue with his earlier life. It could have been trimmed way down. I get why it's all there. It provides and informs crucial character information, vital to the completion of character arcs at the end of the film. That's a give and take though with this area, but I suspect average moviegoers will appreciate this movie, but find the length and complexity in the manner of which is presented a bit challenging to sit through. It didn't help that we had somewhat uncomfortable seats. It's one of those movies where you can give it a B and not miss anything vital, or you can miss something absolutely crucial to understand the next 45 minute barrage of information. So I could say that it's indulgent, as only Christopher Nolan feels like he could get away with all of these things in an R-rated biopic blockbuster. It was strangely only a budget of $100 million and shot in 57 days. 
impressive. I wonder how much money it will make though. I'm curious. Lastly, Nolan makes the creative choice of having explicit nudity, at least compared to most of his other films, in three separate scenes that all kind of come out of nowhere in their extended sequences. The nudity itself makes sense within the scenes, but it adds nothing to the film other than the R rating which makes Oppenheimer less accessible. I get what the scenes themselves were going for thematically, especially the final one, but there was a way to cut around showing so much by letting the intelligence of the audience that Nolan touts understand through situational implications rather than outright showing prolonged nudity and sex. Be aware of that for those that care on the content warnings. I have no idea why this choice was made, as I find it polarizing, and I reject the nudity as deemed to be necessary here. Man, I've been kind of railing on this, haven't I? I hope I've communicated that in the midst of my issues, there's so much to love here. I was shocked at how much I adored the surrealist cuts and sequences, all done practically with no CGI, which is incredible. It adds an unexpected tension to the proceedings, as Oppenheimer's dreams of quantum mechanics become fears of what they're building, ultimately realized in a stunning sequence that will take your breath away. It's done in such a manner that I didn't expect with more subtlety and nuance. And I'm so happy at the care taken there. The dialogue itself is a masterwork when you can hear it. The script carefully explaining, delivering exposition, while never losing the intimate feeling it has with the title character. It is a close look at the Manhattan Project, yes. But first and foremost, it is a detailed, uncomfortable dive into Oppenheimer's psyche and life. The cinematography in particular is a highlight in how it communicates story, no longer using wide vistas to show the desolate testing space creating an atmospheric foreboding with the sets given we know what will occur. But yet shallow depth of field is constantly used in close-ups, creating that sense of inescapable claustrophobia and tension the characters feel with the immense pressure, anger, or humiliation they're all suffering through with this project. It's honestly a masterpiece of blending performances, cinematography, set design, and dramatic irony unfolding for the characters we fear the entire time. Not to mention the music. Oh, the music. Ludwig Gornson has given us the best score of the year and has outdone himself. With themes coming in and out that you recognize highlighting tragedy and the tension and the monumental moments of history, or the smallest pieces of joy or heartbreak that traverse the landscapes of Los Alamos and Oppenheimer's life. It's really that good. I can't wait to listen to it while driving or working or etc. One of the more fun aspects of this movie is just how almost supernaturally stacked the cast is. Many of them you see in the marketing, and many you don't. There's lots of fun surprises here. I felt the DiCaprio meme the whole time pointing at the screen saying, look who it is. And the performances, my gosh. Killian Murphy deserves an Oscar, a performance nuanced and chilling to the bone. Robert Downey Jr. comes in with unexpected fury, who might be the secret MVP actually, if it wasn't for Emily Blunt. I could go on and on, but I'll let them speak for themselves. But this is A-list talent at the top of their game. Rich thematic discussion will abound from Oppenheimer. Conversations such as power, loss, responsibility, hubris, politics, witch hunts, ethics, postpartum depression, and of course, nuclear weaponry and its effects on the world. There's a lot to unpack, a lot to make you think. Did America have to drop the bomb in which Japan had surrendered? Who is ultimately responsible? The creators of the bomb or those that take the creation and use it? Does using the bomb destroy the world literally in a ball of fire? Or does it destroy it by creating an arms race that creates tension to this day. How Oppenheimer fits into all these themes is explicit yet implicit. It highlights his genius but his questionable character given his various infidelities and how he treated certain people. It never quite commits to his answers. He thinks on the big moral dilemma with the bomb until the final muse at the end that is as cold as it is unforgiving as you finally see Oppenheimer blink in the face of potential Armageddon. That's good filmmaking. Challenging, provocative, occasionally uneven, indulgent, hard to hear, brilliance we can only expect from the one and only Christopher Nolan. I give Oppenheimer four out of five stars. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate your support. Remember, always look to the good.